So welcome everybody to this webinar. We're a couple of minutes past the starting time, so let's get going. So thank you very much to everyone for joining this webinar today, this session today, this side event at the Regional Forum on Sustainable Development, focusing on strengthening the recovery through informed citizens and reformed governments. My name is Stephen Weiber. I'm manager for policy and advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. And we are an organization that brings together libraries and information professionals from around the world, both to work together to provide excellent service to communities, but also to talk at the international level and to underline the importance of information and of our institutions. Why talk about information? It's an interesting topic to talk about always because it is both, it can seem very specific, the number of people focusing on information may look small, but at the same time, it's so general, it covers so many parts of our lives, so many dimensions, that it's very easily taken for granted. Information is something that allows us to take decisions. It allows us to learn, to educate. It allows us to find out about opportunities. It's also something that's very much multi-dimensional. There are so many different parts of information, from skills, from connectivity, to being able to find exactly the right sort of content to make a difference. Access to information is referred to clearly within the SDGs. Goal 1610 talks about access to information, but it also appears elsewhere in cross-border access to scientific research in SDG 17 in the skills required for information, in particular highlighted in SDG 5, access to market information, which is so important for agriculture, SDG 2, in so, in so many other areas. And so it's great today to have a panel of people, a group of people who can share their ideas, who can help us understand what it means when we talk about access to information, why information matters so much for development, to talk in particular about the impacts that COVID has had on this access, both on demand and on supply, and to make recommendations on how we can actually realize the potential of information to support development, how we can take this holistic approach that we believe is so necessary in order to have properly informed societies and properly informed governments best able to take the decisions that need to be taken if we are to achieve the SDGs. So, I'm going to stop here and we're going to head into the panel. We are going to organize around three questions and I'll ask each of our panelists to respond to them. Before I invite them to ask each, to respond each time, I'll give a brief introduction, but then we're going to go relatively quickly, try and keep it dynamic. And of course, this is open to you. So I very much recommend you to use the questions and answers button that's available to you to add in your questions, to add in your suggestions, and then we can discuss them most likely at the end. So in which case, the first question that I'm going to ask to the panel is, drawing on your experience, why is access to information in all of its dimensions so important to development? And to start, I'd like to ask Francesco Pisano, who is Director of Libraries and Archives at UN Geneva. So Francesco, over to you. Hey, thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you to IFLA. And also good to see colleagues from, from around the world and around, and around so many areas of international relations and, and information. Well, for me, the, the answer is pretty straightforward. There is, a, there is a, such a powerful connection between information knowledge and, and development. And, and the trick underpinning this is that, of course, knowledge prompts collaboration and collaboration builds knowledge and that drives and that drives uh, development this is very made very very clear uh, in agenda inside the agenda 2030 not only through the goals that you mentioned very skillfully but also in the in the declaration of principles so here there is also a matter of principle of how you give access how open that access should be so while information is everywhere especially in our technologically dominated way of networking bodies of language, of, of, of bodies of knowledge and humans, that information is everywhere now. It's never been so widespread in our civilization, but access is not everywhere. And so that is a factor that affects our capability to drive sustainable development. So it's not going from the theoretical to the practical, our capability to drive um, real sustainable development is directly affected by the degree 
uh, of openness and, and, and access to the information that exists everywhere. So that would be my, my quick answer. Uh, for me, there is, there is no doubt that, that, that knowledge and collaboration are the two strongest pillar of Agenda 2030. And so you cannot access knowledge if there is no access to information. So that is literally the equation that I see in my own experience working for the United Nations. Thank you, Francesco. And, and now I'd like to ask Paolo Lantieri, who is legal officer uh, at the World Intellectual Property Organization for, for your perspectives. Well, good, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks a lot, Stephen Ifla, for this uh, opportunity you're giving to talk about uh, somehow surprisingly niche topic in the IP world. Obviously, uh, you already mentioned, and Francesco made reference, access to information is crucial to any inclusive, democratic, uh, transparent society. And they skip all the linkages with uh, the goals of SDGs and because many other uh, would have uh, a better uh, stand to, to enter in those details. Perhaps the, my best contribution to the panel would be to approach the issue from the perspective of the work of WIPO, intellectual property, and therefore my experience. And so in the field of IP, we see access to information as a key part of the equation, of course, for a number of reasons that are um, obvious but worthwhile mentioned. So first, innovation and creativity are based upon and nurtured by rich access to information and knowledge and data. Uh, examples are countless. We can start uh, basically saying that, that there is no music uh, composers, uh, no musician without access to uh, existing music uh, scores, but also there won't be any weather forecast service uh, without access to meteorological data. That's one element. The second element is that access to information is part, is the basic trade-off uh, that the AP system established between the society and the creators and innovators, basically saying, uh, we're giving you rights to incentivize and reward your effort in exchange, the society would get access to new form of knowledge, new technologies, new information. and. Uh, because uh, these rights are limited in times, because there are certain uses that cannot be controlled and uh, all these kind of uh, uh, free access and reuse of knowledge built uh, through IP, it's referred often as flexibilities of the system. So the IP system takes the importance of information to access to information definitely into account, but when we get into the weeds and uh, details of the systems, things get tend to get a bit more complicated. And I don't wanna overwhelm you, the audience with technicalities, but I think there is one element that's uh, uh, very relevant to our discussion today is that there is a big difference between uh, access and the uh, ability to reuse the information you access to. And this IP regulates it in a very different way. So there is no doubt uh, IP has an impact on how we access information, but mostly intellectual property gives right to control what people can do with things that are protected by IP. And uh, there is confusion because uh, access is not always enough to boost uh, new innovation, new creativity. And I wanna give one example for the non IP lawyers, people in the in, uh, attendees is in the internet so common that we browse, we may find images, we report, studies, anything, a lot of things. If we have an internet connection, we can find it, but that doesn't mean we can reuse it as we wish. There are strict rules, and this needs to be taken into account when we discuss about access to information. So basically to conclude, uh, I just wanted to make access important, not always enough. Increasing this access to information supports clearly the right to information, education, participate in cultural life, benefit from scientific progress. And however, what we'll see, it's very challenging is to achieve uh, that increase uh, in level of access um, by keeping the incentives for new creation. This is something that uh, is uh, 
keeping our governments and policymakers busy and is likely to keep them busy for the years to come because it's far from being a, a, an easy exercise. And I finish that, I think it will enter into details soon. Thank you, Paolo. And, and I think that it, it's an important point, it's such an important point to make that this is a complex issue. It is far more than simply having a connection. And I just wanted to hark back to something that Francesco said, which is also so important, especially given the context of leaving no one behind in the context of the SDGs, thinking that, okay, some of us have access to the internet. This is not the same as universal access to information. There are rules, there are provisions that need to be implemented on the internet. And of course, there are people who don't benefit from anything right now that we need to think of. So thank you. Next, I'd like to invite Raphael Batz uh, from the University of Bordeaux, and who is very active on sustainability within the French library community to offer her first contribution on this question. Raphael. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, I, I think I will answer with a very large focus on your question about information, because it seems to me that um, uh, it's important to, to say and say it again, that information is not only important for development, but it is essential for our society. So I think we can see that question within four fields, which is political, cultural, economic, and personal. So first, uh, the political field, I think that it's important to say that without information and especially for, from governments, uh, it's not possible today to act and react. This is a requirement of transparency of the public policies. So without the access to this information, but also to an analyzed information by journalists, for example, or explain information by teachers, for example, or deconstruct uh, information from by researchers, for example, or transform information by artists, by artists, for example, or organized information by librarians and archivists, or even mobilized information by inhabitants. Without all this information, I think that individuals have no other choice to build their opinions and point of view outside of what say the government in one hand and what say their short entourage in another hand. It means that without information, no one can really emancipate him or herself uh, and build his or her own point of view that lead us uh, to take part to the society and, and to commit ourselves, in fact, to the community. So the second point is cultural. And speaking of communities, I think that the one without information is, uh, by, by the way, excluded from society because he or she can't uh, act in and for it. Um, therefore, it is difficult for this person to recognize uh, the others, but also to be recognized by the other. Having access to information, in fact, is the first step to join the national storytelling, to be the community, but also to add to this national storytelling some uh, inaudible uh, voices and carrying new information, uh, being able to make our society change. Uh, in another one, to build our common in that, in identity, uh, or our capacity to empower ourselves. So third is economics and, and speaking of change, uh, it's also because without information, as, as the colleagues say, we, we can have this freedom to act differently, to change the way we are living in and to invent new way of life as a researcher or, or just us inhabitants, but also entrepreneurs. So without information, there is no innovation. There is no new vaccine, for example. Uh, but there is also no new way to do agriculture, like uh, permaculture. Uh, and finally, it's, it's um, a way to be condemned to start over and over and over the same mistake. And fourth and final, and speaking of troubles, um, without information, our own experience of the daily life is totally changed by information. Without information, uh, how to take the better decision for yourself or for your kind, uh, how to understand what we are facing of uh, this is, for example, uh, how to benefit the opportunity of the society with the, the free services or the new lifelong training programs, for example, and also how to change our behavior for climate change, for example, et cetera, et cetera. So to conclude, I think that the question is not uh, how we need information, is what we cannot do without information because of the absence of information. And without information, it's 
it's basic, but our society is not free. Our citizens are not emancipated. Our communities are not empowered. Our societies are glued in their troubles. Our daily lives are barely bearable. It seems so obvious. And yet the access of, to information is almost absent from the agenda 2013, except okay, the SDG 16 and sometimes some very short, small uh, references. Uh, and I think we need to change that already. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and thank you just for underlining so much this, this need to think clearly and, and coherently about access. And also that reminder that information is, it, it's one of these elements, these preconditions, these sine qua nons of, of development that I think, and, and referring back to what Francesco said at the beginning, there were some key ideas in the SDGs around how do you give, how do you build the capabilities? How do you give everyone the opportunity to realize their potential? And access to information seems to be such a good example of this. So now I'd like to hand on to Emily valoton Preissig, um, who is from Commission uh, 2030 at Biblio Suisse, the Swiss Library Association, working at Alliance Sud. So Emily, over to you. Yes, yeah, thank you, Stephen, for inviting me. Uh, I can only refer to what was said at a general level because, of course, everything that, is, that you said is also true for, for Switzerland. But I think there is uh, one more point that I would like to add, actually, to <laughs> the first one is that um, the agenda, one of the challenges of the Agenda 2030 when we talk about implementing the SDGs is to consider the, 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 the context we are living in. So the real concrete political context. So I would like to say something about this, about Switzerland, and that uh, the other point is, uh, but there are two to put together. Uh, the other point is that we talk about access to information uh, in general, but I think there is one issue that is specifically important too, that is to talk about access to information about sustainable development. So these two issues, I think, go together for Switzerland. They are true for every country, at least any democracy in the world, but especially for Switzerland, because as you know, we live in a direct democracy. And this implies that uh, citizens, of course, cannot vote only for people in their projects uh, in an election, but they can also vote directly for or against a legal uh, framework they can propose a new legal framework uh, to be decided then by the people, and they can oppose a legal measure taken by the parliament and then put it forward um, in a votation to get a final decision. So in this very context, when you uh, consider implementing concretely uh, the SDGs, which means that you are going to take legal measures to go to an actual change, not only principle, but change, so it is absolutely crucial that people get access to information, but that people get access to information about these issues, about sustainable development, and not any kind of information. They need a critical, multi-perspectivist information. And beside that, they also need places where they can discuss, they can get into these issues and debate about that. So it's only, uh, they can also challenge all the, the issues that are linked to sustainability. And it's only at this condition that we can really talk about uh, participation and that we have, we can hope that we can get a certain level of acceptance. And I think I will also say later in the other questions, it's maybe a role for, for libraries. Thank you very much. I think, and as you say, just, just underlining that point, which I think follows on very well from, from Raphael's that, D democracy only works if people have the information on which they can take decisions and we can see that there is that with all the controversies and the worries we have today about misinformation the need for an approach that laissez-faire isn't good enough is an important point to make and so now i'd like to hand over to ton van flimmerer who is the president of the european bureau of library information and documentation associations a leader and a former director of the library in utrecht where i happen to be right now as well so Tom, over to you. Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Ifla, for uh, having me here in this panel. And thank you also for making the bridge from the uh, earlier contributions to what I was thinking to add to the conversation. 
because the question why is access to information important is for me from the perspective of the public libraries especially um, well it's in the IFLA UNESCO uh, library manifesto that <clears throat> the well-informed citizen is the basis for a democratic society and of course the library is the gatekeeper of that and um, if we look at that um, and to the sustainable development goals it's not only about the information and the way we implement them but also the process that is guiding us all in society in doing that and in my opinion that only can be and it was mentioned before uh, in a democratic uh, way um, now if you look at what um, um, libraries can do they they play and we will discuss that later an important role in that information um, but also we see that the access to information has to be protected in constitutions in every country in europe and also in uh, library legislation for example in the nordic countries in, in uh, norway for instance um, uh, supporting the democracy is uh, in the legislation for libraries as a goal they have to uh, support. So I think <clears throat> that is uh, a part of the connection uh, between uh, uh, the, the, the importance of information for a democratic society and the role of libraries in that. At the same time, we see that, and it was mentioned before, access is not enough only, but we see that um, this, this process is changing and in uh, a certain way also at risk. Um, research has shown that uh, the algorithms used by the big tech companies uh, uh, bring you into three clicks into a tunnel of information where you uh, hardly can leave. And um, in the Netherlands, we have elections coming up for the parliament next week and research by a consortium of uh, university people and others has shown that the same algorithms apply there. So if the citizen wants to inform his, uh, himself or herself uh, on, on, in, in the democratic process, uh, it's, it's already very complicated. And um, Nina uh, Schick, she is the author of Deep Fake and the Infocalypse she has um, uh, well uh, uh, created the, the 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 notion that um where in in the old days people used to have science and used to have newspapers and television programs as a kind of common ground where you could disagree and debate and have a democratic process now due to the algorithms and also due to more and more deep fake uh, people live in their own realities and I think that is, um, well, um, we, we have seen with, of course, what happened in the United States. Uh, uh, we see the people uh, who are very uh, devoted to conspiracy theories in the pandemic, that um, these realities uh, don't come together anymore. There is no common ground to be debated. And that is a risk also in implementing uh, the sustainable development goals, because everyone needs to be on board in society uh, to work on that. So I want to leave it here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you for really underlining that point about the need for action, the need to actually to think constructively, coherently about this, that we're in this strange situation where there is both, from one point of view, infobesity, and this is this is not a, a new term, the idea of having so much information that we're lost and we don't know where to go, but also in a situation where actually people are facing information scarcity, that they don't aren't necessarily able to find the information they need to take the actual decision. So it's a strange contrast. It's a, a, a strange it, it's a strange contrast of situations. Now I, I want to move on to the second question because. A lot of what you said was was true back in in December 2019, before before COVID turned up and and before the world changed completely. I think, of course, across the library field, we've seen the importance of information. We've seen COVID. Obviously, primarily, it's a health crisis, and and clearly, the first concern always has to be for 
the people who are suffering from COVID, the people who are on the front lines dealing with it, the health workers, they are the people who have made such a huge contribution to minimizing the damage to making things as, as doing as well as we can. But of course, we've also seen huge impacts from COVID and from the measures that have been taken to respond on information. So the second question I have is going to be, what impacts has the pandemic had on the supply of and demand for information? And so again, I'd like to turn to Francesco Pisano to, to offer your thoughts on that one, Francesco. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Well, first of all, I would say that the world has been changing all, the, all along. It's, the, the difference between December 19 and December 20 going 21 is the pace, I would say. So COVID really has two sides. One is not so ugly because it's a potent accelerator in a time of our civilization where we're running out of time. And so there is good to be gained from, from, from that. I, I think that the, the impact before going into the specific of information, maybe we can put a lens between the information and the COVID. And that reveals a couple of things that I thought were very interesting already at the end of, of last year. So this is, this is, you know, this thing is causing a new type of crisis. And we have built for, you know, more, more than a century, a system able to respond to all the crises we knew before. And that is the fundamental error of our civilization, sub, sub using imagination and using a lot of what we have known in the past. And here we are, with this new crisis that reveals basically um, how rigid and outdated our system is, as simple as that. And so if you, if you look at it at the organizational level, the pandemic is like a, a, a floodlight on organizations that are still relying on predominant models and known processes. And they go right into the wall and they kill anyone, everyone on board just doing what they're being preset to do. So this rigidity is life-threatening and we've seen it actually in the health system and information, I'm, you know, we're not going to share more on the, on the vital role of information in the health system. We are among information specialists here. But when you look at how much single in organization in industries, including information, were able to deploy uh, just starting one year ago in spring uh, 2020 to react to this and basically not lose completely everything they had gained so far. You can also see the organizations have incredible resilience. And if, if COVID is here to teach organizations some things that if they keep that resilience and avoid rolling back in the old ways, then, then there is a new future uh, uh, awaiting, awaiting them. Now, if we look at a different level, a systemic level, not our organizational level, but our systemic level. I think that the, the, the crisis has revealed, you know, that the ancestral narratives of domestic strategic interest before the global uh, goals is still there. We have all witnesses this knee-jerking reactions of entire nations and sometimes even regional organizations of nations all, you know, knee-jerking in the, in, the, in, the, in, the same, in the same way. That tells me that our collective intelligence has not reached maturity. As simple as that. And so how do you reach maturity and intelligence? By being repeatedly told that you're not mature enough. And so COVID is basically, you know, blaring this message uh, at all levels. And I think that um, when you look at um, knowledge services and information services, there was more demand. Well, simply because people were working from home. Entire organizations were spread so thin that never been before. But the supply side, I, I'm unable to quantify the supply, but what I'm able to see is that the supply still responded to those strategic and political criteria that were there in 2019 and in 1819 for that matters. So this is how you know, this thing called COVID generating a crisis called pandemic is actually showing us. And a part of that I would insist is actually for the good. Thank you. I think that, 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 that sets us up extremely well. And I think this, this contrast that you set out between the demand is there, that people are realizing the need for information, the, the value of it, how much it changes in life, but then 
we'll get on with the next question certainly well what what can we do about the supply and, and how can governments help um over to you now uh paolo what what's, what's your perspective yes. on this one the, the supply and demand well again i guess my question would be much more sectorial than uh, one provided by francesco but uh in this field, I think there is the first good uh, the first trend we can see is that unlike many other sectors, pandemic has not reduced the demand for information and content. That's for sure. Uh, on the contrary, people uh, increase their reading, uh, news watching, more in general, uh, browsing the internet, uh, leaving aside, of course, uh, their own words and, and uh, the threat uh, that are coming from like uh, suggestion of content, machine learning, which is really not my 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 topic here. But I want to make an acknowledgement of the importance of that, of how what we access at the end is filtered by often by mechanisms we don't control, we don't understand. But leaving that aside, I think if we want to speak um, here about content as one of the element of the broader category information. We need to make a differentiation here. I guess it's fair to say that creative content has never been more important than during uh, this pandemic, uh, both for education, entertainment, but ov obviously also for keeping uh, an informed society, like uh, referring to the objectives of accessing access to information. Citizens were locked at home and uh, found uh, uh, in access content, uh, one of the few uh, way of spending their days and comfort uh, uh, their their situation and adapted to new delivery methods and new forms of content for sure. And whenever this, of course, was made possible by decent connectivity and availability of ICTs, we have to remember and much of this new knowledge and new patterns will remain after COVID. So that's one thing. So they, there was a more, more need, more demand and an adaptation from uh, the user side. From the supply side, uh, side, the pandemic has been a disruptor of uh, several sectors of the creative industries and creators. And this is not hard to understand when you shut down theater, cinemas, uh, retail shop, uh, you cancel concerts. It's not hard to understand the impact uh, it has on like the people that are living out of these things, but also has accelerated, as Francesco pointed out, innovation and technological shifts in many sectors has required the access to the digital world to a lot of knowledge was not was never going to be digitized, was going to be stored somewhere. So if we take one example, which is a very relevant one, I guess, in, in this discussion, depending on which study we look at, but the pandemic has shut down schools around the world and uh, around 1.2 billion children have uh, been out of the classroom. So as a result, education uh, uh, changed dramatically, the means of education, with vast expansion of e-learning whereby teaching is taking remotely, like exactly like the chat we're having today and on digital platforms. So this unforeseen shift has been possible, uh, of course, in countries where there were technical tools and connectivity, because in others, this was not happening. And uh, whenever that basic element was present, uh, it was possible through a combination of several factors I want to mention three here, but there are many more. One, I guess it was the almost revolutionary efforts of institutions like schools, universities, and libraries that really tried very hard to, with the, their means to go there. And uh, I think it's a good thing. We acknowledge also some new solutions for distribution and licensing of content. And uh, of course, uh, it was also supported by the flexibilities of the system, the copyright system that we referred before. Mm -hmm. uh, even with all that, uh, resources were still the most important factor when you go to, to this kind of uh, ambitious endeavor of switching uh, something that was working offline to completely online. But the acceleration that we experienced during the last 12 months, I think, it was really phenomenal and uh, it has some 
good message to the world. Of course, we we I'm speaking from uh, now Italy, but I'm based in Switzerland, so it's quite easy. We we acknowledge well, there is a lot to be done, but again, like Francesco pointed out, I think uh, the pandemic uh, has accelerated also positive trends in terms of accessing access information. Thank you, and, and thank you in particular for, for bringing things into focus around those, those specific SDGs where, where this makes a difference, education obviously being such a, a crucial one. And I think the point is, it, it is an interesting one that previously and teaching has happened since humans have, <laughs> humans have existed, we've always taught each other, but this sort of sudden shift has forced people to think about, well, how does that access to information happen? How do you get the information? How do you share the information? So. It's interesting, it's an acceleration of how we do it. It's also an acceleration of how we think about it. And the issues you, you raise there sort of summarize things very well. So now I'd like to go over to, to, to Raphael from, from your experience. What's your experience? What's your perspective on how demand uh, on supplies? So thank you. And this time, I think I will answer with a strong focus on libraries. Uh, so for two reasons. The first one is I think that libraries are really trying to answer the four challenges of information that I mentioned uh, earlier. And second, because libraries in France, where I'm living, are now the only public and cultural institutions opened. Museums, cinema, theater, etc. are closed, but libraries are opened. And it seems to me that the ability of the library to address these four fields of information, so political, cultural, economic, personal life, explains that situation. So uh, what we have seen in libraries today in France, uh, and when I say today, I mean in a non-lockdown, non-confinement time, but with a curfew very early in the day, so 6 p.m., um, is a strong demand of information on three axes. Um, so first, people want document, want documents that allow them to avoid the pressure generated by the situation. So reading, leisure, novels, etc., uh, to occupy the children when they cannot go out, activity books, comics, etc., but also to project themselves towards the future. Information books, training books for vocational reorientation, linking to the <laughs> increasement of unemployment. So this reading is done first on printing documents, and that's what I want to say. Speak about this because uh, today everyone hears because of. Uh, teleworking, um, more than ever blocked face on his computer all day long. And uh, um, the days before lockdowns, because we have done, we have had two, um, libraries were overwhelmed and uh, in fact emptied uh, of their collection by users who were so anxious to plan their supply of uh, printed materials. Uh, in the university libraries in this moment in France, there is now, it's, it's very new, a learn and return system through our friends to react to the fact that students have left their place of study to return uh, to their parents' home. <clears throat> Sorry, at their parents' home. Uh, and sometimes it's very far from their university. So consequently, in terms of supply, I think that a serious mistake would be to think that the inhabitants, the citizens, uh, no longer need printed documents and that the information will only go through the web and especially through social networks. However, many residents uh, sure have not returned to the library in this moment for three reasons. So one is because they think they are closed. And the second is because the curfew uh, reduced the leisure time to a time restricted at the uh, place of home. And uh, the third thing is uh, the concern of contamination, of course. So uh, why printed collection should not be reduced? Uh, digital mediation by library, which make it possible to give access to information to those who cannot come, and particularly the elderly, uh, should be developed more than ever. And there is therefore a strong need in terms of supply uh, to finance the development of skills of librarians, for example, but also to finance the creation of platform for mediation of knowledge. The second thing is people want documents that help them to understand the situation especially in a context where the notion, as my colleagues say, the certainty, certainty or conviction are increasingly abused, in fact, by the spread of conspiracy theories, but also because of the government difficulty to giving satisfactory answers to the situation. So libraries are working hard on this issue. 
uh, by increasing their participation in the media and information education more than before uh, to help the inhabitants with reading and evaluating uh, information, fighting fake news, for example. Uh, for example, the ministry in France supported the creation of a platform of educational resource on media and information education. And finally, inform the information, because it, I said it's, uh, there is an objective of emancipation. Uh, and I think that emancipation cannot be held just with the um, access to an information that is legitimated by government or by publishers. And in fact, the library are trying to play a role in the socialization of individuals, in uh, the development of a social capital that can help the transfer of mobilized uh, knowledge. And this social role uh, has a great success in libraries. And, and this demand for sociability is obviously thwarted by the situation, okay, the health situation, which actually limits uh, the interaction. However, um, the library are trying to recreate this sociability uh, in uh, giving uh, no contact, but the appearance of the other. Many libraries, not specifically in France, uh, have worked to give um, uh, to the citizens a voice uh, on their COVID experience. It's a work of collecting, valuing, organizing the knowledge of inhabitants facing the pandemic. And I think it's a very, uh, it's a vital importance in, for the identity and cultural question as well political issues of information to be addressed today. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate that, that, that focus on the individual firstly in terms of <clears throat> what works for people, what works for individuals, and making the point that clearly some people can't travel. There are, you do need to invest in, in information solutions for people, but also that point about physical and digital. I, I know that in the library field, many other fields, there are so many people who love the smell of a new book much more than they love the smell of a new e-reader. Uh, and there's, <laughs> there's certainly a lot of feelings, lots of anecdotes out there about how much more powerful that is and also your point which i think is, is a really interesting one a really important one about information can be a multi-way thing you know access to information as set out in the universal declaration is not just to receive it's also to impart it's to send and so mobilizing that possibility developing the skills for people to work together to create their own information is, is so important so now i'd like to hand over to to amelie uh, for your perspectives on on supply and demand amelie Yes, thank you. So uh, I'm living in a context that is quite close to Raphael's one, but uh, we have some slight differences still. Um, it's funny because you said uh, we realized how people uh, still want print uh, world, and we realized how much actually the school in Switzerland was so print oriented and not so much uh, in, into digital skills. So this is one of the learnings uh, we had from the pandemic. And linked to that, uh, we also saw that uh, there is uh, well, new, uh, us as libraries, we knew that before by experience that there was a big digital gap in Switzerland, but it was never uh, studied. We had no facts and figures in order to bring that uh, in, into a political discourse or at a political level. So now we can see uh, that with the, the closure of schools and libraries, uh, there, are lo there were a lot of articles in the media, and now we have actually facts and figures that have come out that we can now um, use in order to, 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 to bring this uh, discourse at the political level. So this is one of the good things of the uh, pandemic. Uh, the second thing I, I would like to, to say again is uh, also uh, in echo with what uh, Rafael said, but slightly different. Uh, I think uh, the pandemic um, put a light on one of the major role of libraries in a society of information, and it, it, it's its role of mediation, of a cultural, scientific, and political mediation. Uh, indeed, we can see in Switzerland that uh, there are very hard tensions that we usually not be that hard between people and between people and institutions. 
And of course, I, I guess it's normal in any crisis, but this crisis had a specificity that is social isolation. Rafael also talked about that, but it's, I think it's very important for uh, information because isolation from family, from friends, from colleagues, but also from larger group that you meet in social and cultural institutions like restaurants, theater, museum, and libraries. Uh, this isolation has an impact on the provision and on the reception of uh, information. And uh, we could see uh, during uh, all the crisis in, until now that uh, in Switzerland, the, the government was communicating, communicating, communicating over and over and over. And on the other side, we had the media who was trying, were trying to have a critical insight into this communication of the government. But in the middle of that, where normally you discuss with people around you, you challenge the point of view, you, you, you discuss, you, you create, you build your own meaning, um, then this, this, didn't, this didn't exist. It was only internet and the social media. And as it was uh, told before, internet and the social media brings you into a tunnel and only brings, brings you back always to what you already think and what you're already convinced of. So this is very uh, dangerous. And um, there was, during this crisis, a total lack of uh, mediation. So really a, a, an opportunity to individuals that they can get an active role in information, it means to debate, to question, to endorse a point, a point of view, to be challenged and to progress. And uh, this is a danger for democracy and for social peace. And uh, we can see that uh, this phenomenon is radicalizing every, everyone's point of view. And I think we have to consider this, uh, that during this crisis, this, uh, these places were really missing and that we should be aware of that for the future crisis we will have to face, uh, like climate change, all these uh, crisis we know we really have to, to go through. And um, I think this is a role that library already libraries already have taken since some years. They have developed all the mediation services, but now it really needs to be uh, thought of in these terms and also reinforced. Thank you. And, and, and thank you for underlining that, that point about intermediation and through what you said, how important it is across the SDGs. So, you mentioned democracy, you mentioned climate change, you mentioned education, and I'm sure we can talk about so many other areas where helping people, that sort of taking a, a proactive approach to think about how to help people use information to achieve, make progress across the SDGs is, is so important. So now I'd like to hand over to Tom. Um, what are your, your perspectives, your experiences of evolutions in the supply of and demand for information? Tom. Well, a lot has already been said, but I like to start with connecting to what from Francesco said uh, with the motto, never waste a good crisis. And although he uh, implied that we as a society may be not mature enough to grab all the opportunities that are there, I think uh, there is indeed uh, uh, a lot of possibilities um, uh, where we can develop uh, both uh, as a society, but also the work of libraries. And uh, that was one of the reasons that uh, Eblida in May 2020 already uh, uh, produced a report on what all libraries in Europe were doing um, in different services, like on health information, uh, but also in, in digitizing their normal uh, information services. Um, if I look at, at, at the question, I would say um, we, we were in a situation where there was less, uh, uh, less opportunities and at the same time more need for information because the questions raised by this pandemic are not only about uh, the pandemic itself and health information, but there's also questions like uh, of the role of the state uh, as many countries had uh, a period of neoliberal governments uh, and withdrawing role of the state, now the state is more and more in control or uh, influences the freedom of, of individuals. So also your privacy and your freedom are questioned. Um, the, the pandemic raises questions on how we consume and how we produce our food and, and other goods. Um, questions about an inclusive 
society and solidarity between uh, citizens and different groups in, in society, and also raises questions about inequalities, um, like people that really were left behind, like elderly people who didn't have the digital skills to connect to information or to have social contacts, or like mentioned before, uh, kids in school who couldn't uh, attend online uh, um, education because they and their parents didn't have the means or the skills to do so. And if you take a closer look at these questions, they are all connected to different SDGs. So we are really in, in, in an opportunity to discuss this in our society. At the same time, um, the, the, the libraries, uh, if I focus on them, um, were limited in their possibilities to address this. Um, if, if you take the earthquake 2010 in, in New Zealand or in Nepal 2015, if I remember correctly, the libraries were um, a, 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 a house of the community in their villages and cities where people got together to have information, to express their feelings, to connect and into, uh, in interpreted to, in, no, to have an interpretation of what was happening. And as the libraries were closed, we were not having the possibility to have these debates as Emily already uh, said. And I think um, when it comes to information, it is the possibility to access it, to have the skills to do that, but it's also to give a meaning to it, uh, to have an interpretation of this information and that is happening in the interaction between uh, citizens and um, that is where libraries uh, can play a big role and um, well um, now being only open for takeaway or even being completely closed uh, that is very uh, limited so um, I think there is um, a great opportunity once we are open again to address all these issues and, and work on, on these questions and these SDGs. Uh, for the moment, uh, we are limited in our possibilities because we can do a lot online, but it's not enough, I would say. Thank you so much. And I think thank you for, for providing that further clarification on the different roles that need to be played in order to meet this demand for information. So uh, clearly as you underlined, it's the connectivity for all, it's the skills, it's the possibilities to come together, the spaces, and raising some of the issues we, we've heard previously, it is the content, the possibility to, for people to find information that responds to their needs. So I think we're, we're, we're coming up with a sort of a shopping list of those elements, those actions, those services that, that need to be provided if we are to be able to respond to this growing demand for information that existed before COVID-19, but accelerated during COVID-19. I think this brings us on very nicely to the final question I've got down. Um, before I ask it, I, I would remind all of our participants, please use <clears throat> the questions and answers button in order to ask any questions. That way all of our panelists will be able to see them and think about their responses. Um, but to go on to the final question now, um, what recommendations would you make to decision makers about how they can better support access to information as part of the response to and recovery from COVID-19? And so for this, I'd like again to turn to Francesco for your ideas. Francesco. Thank you. Um, well. I think that as reality and things become more complex, which is certainly what's happening in our world now, decision makers have more than just the responsibility of taking decisions. They have the responsibility of ensuring the decision-making processes, appropriate processes are available in future for those who follow. And I think that that responsibility is felt less in the crisis mode because we as humans tend to react to crises much more than we react to the possibility of good and bad things happening in our, in our future. When you look at the decision-making process, especially at policy-making level, what well, that is a sequence of information elaboration, basically. So if we, if we start from that, um, my first recommendation is that 
the knowledge system, man management system that we call libraries, public, scientific, et cetera, et cetera, needs to be brought back to the front, not only because they represent virtual and physical spaces in which decisions can count on the largest amount of information, but because there are information verificators themselves. And so there is an issue of, not an issue, there is an aspect of quality availability and access. There is an equation that is complete only when you dispose of the entire um, uh, range of knowledge resources. Now, I think that a sixth grader could tell us that that's not the case for the internet. And that is even less the case when you browse through the internet. And it's going to be even less, less the case when the algorithm that, that uh, makes you browse through the internet has learned your ways. And so I think that libraries should be the system, not libraries as single actors, but this, the, the, how they've been conceived, because after all, they've been around for a thousand years, there must be a reason for that, should be brought back to the front. The second is for libraries and themselves not to sit still. This is, this is something that I have uh, repeatedly said, that when libraries wait for the world to come back and ask for pardon, uh, because we're the best. Well, the world may not actually come back uh, so 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 you know so swiftly in our lifespan. So they have this responsibility to connect that comes on top of the responsibility to collect. Now, this is something that I've heard from a distinguished researcher um, uh, or employee of the British Library, and I used to repeat it a lot. I really like it. It was so British to say, you know, collect, co connect as much as you collect. And I, I think it's very, very true, um, especially when you look at where is knowledge. So a thousand years ago, knowledge was locked in libraries. So it was geographically located, you had to walk to the knowledge. Now, knowledge is everywhere. And the portion of life knowledge on Earth is actually in our brains, isn't it? And books that we keep in libraries are summaries of what were in several one or more brains. And so that is, that is in, in the double fact. So when I hear Ton talk about this role of libraries, when I hear Amélie and Raphael talking about this mediation, mediation in French, it's absolutely true. And how much we have underestimated this in our you know, um, sort of uh, frenzy for anything online is actually scary to me. Um, and I think this could be corrected very, very easily for decision makers at policy level. Thank you very much. And, and I know it's been said by four, before, before often by people who were behind the internet. I've, I've certainly heard it from Vint Cerf, for example, underlining that the people who created the internet, what they were trying to do was to create a, a bigger, more accessible library. And I know that increasingly we're seeing some of these people involved back at the beginning think, well, we need to go back to these principles of libraries. We need to go back to thinking about how we share this information. So, uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, I'll then hand over to, to, to Paolo from your point of view, what can, what can governments do? Yeah, uh, so I, again, uh, we have to take uh, the broad picture and narrow down, especially when we come to recommendations. I, I really take this opportunity to, to focus on one specific uh, issue, which uh, is not that small. It's, I wanted to, to focus on what we define as public sector information, which are like this vast category of knowledge and information that is produced directly or indirectly by governments, public sector. So we learned that they, public entities produce basically a huge amount of all sorts of information in their daily tasks and they cover climate, geography, demography, legal matters, business, all sorts of uh, fields of um, human uh, intellect and studies and uh, this information come uh, in different forms they, they are reports statistics charts audiovisual archives databases websites and so on so what i want to remind the, the policymakers is that in principle and by default most of the forms in which public sector information all this wealth of information is accessible to us is actually protected by IP, by default, by copyright. And therefore there are conditions for access and reuse imposed to citizens. 
unless something is done. And um, we already discussed, there is uh, clearly, like uh, we don't need to remind, there are strong public interest in, in many advantages in giving access to this public sector information, especially because we are talking about things that is being created by or directly or indirectly with public money. And the government may consider policies that facilitate access to this big body of knowledge and information. In order to do that, they need to treat public sector information differently from uh, other kind of content, like uh, a blockbuster movie, for instance. So at WIPO, we studied this matter in the context of the development agenda. And the result, the outcome of the studies that are reflected in a couple of reports are partially surprising in one sense that is, there, there is a big divide of awareness of the importance of public sector information. So you have uh, the developed world where this awareness of the importance of or access to of public sector information is already established. We have the European Union with a new directive that replaced an older one. We have uh, the United States of America where at the federal level, whatever is produced by the federal government falls in the public domain from day one. Plus, if you go, for instance, the web, White House website, it's everything is licensed under Creative Commons. And then you have the UK, Australia, New Zealand, where they have open repositories of public uh, information. So it's more and more has been done by developed uh, economies and very little, with few exceptions, is happening in uh, in the other region of the world. So uh, this is my message. I mean, we understand, and uh, being part of this panel made me even more aware of that. IP is really, this is a much broader field. IP plays just a marginal role, but it can be a poten potentially decisive one. And it's the one that will tell people what they can or cannot do with this information we try to make access. So grant tax is very important. Um, so my message is take a look at this area because it's worthwhile, especially when you have to decide what to do with the things you government create to avoid that such a rich sources of information uh, remain not fully exploited, but unreusable or worse, completely inaccessible. So Mm, that's really my message. Thanks. Thank you so much. And it, 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 it's a powerful, it's quite a striking point that it would be developed countries, which are arguably the ones that, that obviously benefit from more advantages right now anyway, that they're also the ones that are giving themselves the possibility through the open licensing of public information to move further. And so, of course, that risks creating the gap, creating a, a wider gap. This is also it's also an interesting area is there's, there has been the Escazio agreement and that's a, it's a, a Latin American thing, but actually international agreements underlining the importance of full access, this sort of information to improve environment. And so there's a, the SDGs from 12 to 15. It, it's, it's something that has been recognized and that is such a crucial part of realizing this wider potential of access to information. So now I'd like to hand to, to Rafael, what, what are your recommendations for governments in this regard? Uh, thank you. So I think that the first thing for me to do would be to, and that's what I've been said a lot of times during this uh, meeting, uh, to support open access and open science. Uh, uh, because it's allow researchers to have access to more data for their own research, but also allow citizens to read scientific uh, results beyond the media coverage of certain researchers. So it's uh, it's very important. I, I will not continue this because uh, it, it has been said a lot of times. So the second things to do for me um, or to convince the stakeholder. Uh, yeah, to, it would be to, to integrate uh, the territorial actors of the information as librarians, of course, uh, in the meetings of uh, construction of public policies. So, for example, uh, if a municipality organizes a meeting uh, of different departments uh, of the municipality to 
organize uh, I don't know the implementation of vaccination in this in the city it seems to me that it's very important to invite the library uh, because uh, it can be a place for displaying the information and first reason is because it's the place where is uh, which is the most frequented by inhabitants and second thing is because the library is touching or reaching out uh, some um, inhabitants from the most sensitive areas of the say of the cities and uh, uh, in in some place uh, the library is the only public services that is offered on these places so it's very important to to have the library in the team and uh, to to in too many occasions the the library is uh, totally forgotten uh, by the municipality uh, because uh, if we are not talking about culture uh, they don't think about libraries. So that there is very um, an, an issue and a challenge for, for the development, the territorial development, the local development to have the library on the board. So, and of course, because the library can, uh, um, let's say, I could be the companion of the, the politics uh, to with uh, printed and digital documents, verified, of course. And finally, it seems to me that um, uh there is a, a a true work to be done on a national or on a local to uh roadmaps for sustainable development in uh, adding um this notion of information in the text so in france when uh, france were was working on the uh roadmap uh, for uh, implementation of uh, development, uh, sustainable development in France, uh, we really work and fight for having the library mentioned or information mentioned, because as I said in, at the first question, it, it's so obvious that we are tending to uh, forget it. So we have, they have to talk about information in the text, in the objectives, but also in the indicators. So for example, for improving the health of the inhabitants, it, they, it requires a good information. And we see it every day with the break in this moment for vaccination. Uh, this would involve defining what type of indicator can show that uh, national or local government has improved access to information in its territory. Uh, whether or not having a library is properly end of is generally a good indicator of this attention, but it's not sufficient uh, if the library is not involved in the development and the implementation of public development policies in general. So that's my my three things that I think I could we could do. Thank you. Thank you, and and. I I will probably return to that question at the end of how do you actually make, make that bridge across the different policy areas and how do you actually integrate properly. Um, uh, now to you, Emily, what was your perspective from, from, from Switzerland? Yeah, <clears throat> again, I will say something about Rafael, what Rafael said. Um, and I, I, actually, I know it is also the spirit of uh, your work in France, so I'm, I'm just saying it in another way. Um, what you said about uh, having libraries involved in the in the politic uh, discussion, uh, it's also the responsibility of libraries to involve themselves into this uh, discussion. And um, uh, for this, uh, in Switzerland, I would say there are two main themes, uh, and we are working about it as a library association, but uh, the pandemic has given us, us more arguments, as I said before. So the first uh, point is the digital gap. So uh, in this regard, our message is that um, until now, the government always uh, takes into account uh, elderly people and also uh, people who are in the school and people who are in the professional system so they can have access to continued uh, education. But they always forget everyone else. So people who are not uh, at school and who are not in a in a professional um, activity and these people there are very many people and these are the people who are uh, most um, confronted to uh, digital difficulties we have seen that now with the new facts we have uh, with, due to the homeschooling 
that have shown that many, many parents had uh, very many difficulties to follow their kids, to help them, to even have the right hardware to do things. And so, so this we need to, to work on this on, in Switzerland, really. And uh, for this, we need to, to get involved as libraries and to, to show the work we can do and to make it recognized. And the, the second point I would say is uh, what I was saying before about the work of mediation in libraries, because right now we have um, two things going on uh, in the same time in Switzerland. We have the government has published its uh, strategy for, for uh, sustainable development on the one side where the strategy insists on the importance of the citizens to be informed, to, be, to know what we talk about, etc. Uh, and on the other way, we had an action of the Confederation uh, that goes in the, in a complete um, other way. Uh, because until the last uh, last year, the Confederation was supporting financially NGOs, some NGOs, to do this work of information about development towards the general public. And uh, very recently, the Confederation decided that uh, it will not com continue this uh, support. So now there is the there will be a dangerous gap in this regard. We have actually no one covering these issues anymore. And um, we need as uh, information professionals, especially those who are specialized in these issues, we need to, to gather now to, to sit with the, the government to find a, a common solution for this. Thank you so much. And, and I think it was a really interesting point that you made about the people who risk falling through the gaps. As it's true that from the point of view of a government, if you're an education ministry, you think about pupils and teachers. If you're a ministry for older persons, you think about older people. If you're a ministry for employment, you think about those who are in work. But of course, the SDGs ask us to look from the point of view of the individual, because every individual has a right and so needing, uh, finding a way to think about, well, what are the services that are universal and how can they actually help everyone achieve this access to information is, is, is super important. Um, I, should have, I, I should obviously apologize both to Emily and Tom that, that you've been going last and so you've had this moral pressure to come up with something original to say each time and every time you've managed for which I, I salute you. Um, I'm raising the bar obviously for you, Tom, now, but. I'd welcome your, your thoughts about what recommendations you would make to governments as regards this. Well, thank you for that, uh, Stephen. Um, um, I won't repeat what, what is said, but um, I, I like to pick up on what I mentioned earlier that um, uh, uh, the questions raised by the pandemic uh, are questions that uh, are connected to the SDGs. And I would like to add now that the SDGs are also very much connected to the values that libraries stand for. That is equality, no discrimination, learning opportunities. Uh, and that's, that's the reason I think it's important that libraries work on, uh, on the SDGs. And um, th I would like to address the decision makers that they understand that libraries uh, can work and will work on these SDGs. I had some, some discussion with some politicians saying, oh, uh, but you are about the books, aren't you? And also, um, isn't that a, a left-wing hobby? And um, I like to quote David Lankers who said, well, some things are not left-wing or right-wing. They're uh, not left or right ideas. They are just good ideas. And um, I think there should be some, some acceptance in it. Also that um, decision makers can support on the local level, but also on the national level, um, um, the possibilities of libraries to work on this because it's a new role for libraries. And we all in the library world, uh, well, are a bit curious uh, about who's gonna pay the bill for this COVID crisis. And of course, there is some anxiety that libraries might be part of that. While if we want to pick up on new tasks, we need to have more possibilities. And that is the reason that in Blida, we identified in the European structural funds, the possibilities for libraries to connect. But there again, 
it's on also on the national level and the national management authorities to decide if libraries will be part of the policy and will have uh, funding opportunities in in this context um i think libraries when they they start working on sdgs uh, become um well you could say an agent for movement in society and that is uh, not being neutral but it's also not the same as being a political uh, uh, agent um, i think we have a delicate balance uh, to stay a trusted source of information in our society and at the same time work on these areas uh, because well we have seen what happened to free press uh, we see, saw their equipment demolished uh, when the, the capital was uh, run over by uh, uh, this gang um, we don't want libraries to uh, uh, end up in that corner uh, and that means also that uh, the decision makers that finance with public money libraries have to understand what our role is, but also we have to be, uh, well, um, taking care of this delicate balance, I would say. Um, citizen science and the role public libraries can play uh, is mentioned already, and also the importance of libraries as a place where people can acquire skills both being literate and uh, acquire digital skills is, uh, is, is mentioned. And I like to connect to what Rafaela said that um, um, if you are a decision maker, um, have a broader look uh, because I believe strongly that a kind of alignment of what the policy on the local level, on the national level, and in our case on the European level is, and what there are uh, like funding opportunities to work on that uh, is, is creating possibilities and is very important. So um, that alignment, I, I believe strongly sh uh, can be uh, 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 better. And um, then, um, well, I like to stress what is already said that if uh, policies are made, libraries still are often forgotten um, that means that we have to do better and demonstrate the impact we have in society and shout louder. We have a lot to tell and we have a lot to be proud of, but we have to be included in, uh, in the policies as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Very, that was a really good, powerful final message. So um, as before, Please, people, if, if, if participants would like to ask questions, please ask them in, in the chat or in, in the on the, the, the questions and answer board. I wanted to give the other panelists a, a quick opportunity, especially those who, who spoke earlier. Um, do you have any responses to, to, to what's been said? Otherwise, I know I have a question. Okay, so I'll, I'll go with my question. Um, so, Ton, you, you talked about the importance of connecting up the the, um, the national, the local, the national, and the European. From your point of view, and from the point of view of of all those who are involved on this call, what could be done at the UN level in order to give this national international steer, especially within the context of the Sustainable Development Goals? in order to underline this importance of information or to underline what's in order to underline the importance of information in order to underline what needs to be thought about what needs to be done and i'm conscious of course that paolo was already doing this through his work at wipo so i think it, i think in your question there is already the answer i think it's so important uh, these issues are on the agenda uh, they should be uh, uh, advocated, and that is also what not only UN is doing, but also what IFLA is doing, and what Iblida is doing in in in, in Europe. And um, I think that that um, at the same time, it, it, well, there is of course uh, the, the 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 democratic process that those who are climate skeptic or they they need to have a voice as well but they need to be addressed as well. 
and they need to be included in the debate. And um, we are all struggling to find ways to do that and, and to create that bridges where people can get together and, and, and uh, uh, well, Rem Kolas, the, the famous Dutch architect, once said there are only two public spaces where people of all gender and ages and, and religion come together. That is in the prison and in the public library. And I'm not sure if that's true anymore, but at least it should be true for the libraries. And um, I think that um, uh, we can do that better if there's notions on, on a global level uh, how important that is and and why we need to do this thank you um any thoughts from francesco uh, paolo rafael emily sure i think you have questions there in the, in the question and answer um, we we, we do indeed um so in which I, case I, just I, I invite excuse me I, I just want to to answer also to your question I, and, and i really think that uh, what we could do with um, on the un level is to advocate the need of indicators related to the information because if we just had uh, there is a need to information to have a good health uh, uh, it's not enough because it's too generally, it's too obvious for a lot of people, even if it's not so obvious for all the countries. So I really think that we need some indicators. We need to have, and, and it's very difficult. Uh, in EBLIDA, uh, we are working on this question and, and defining the, the indicators of, uh, um, uh, sorry, of information is not so so obvious because what we we were going to say: um, Do you have or not a library? Uh, how many people are going to the library? Uh, what kind of people are coming to the library? Uh, what are they doing with this uh, information, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, what kind of indicator? So, I think that we have a lot of work to do uh, in the um, in the information information field and discuss that with the UN level to implement uh, new indicators. Absolutely. I, 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 absolutely. And of course, there's work in other fields to look at the effectiveness of other types of information, which can really be interestingly brought together here, because this isn't just a concern for libraries. There's plenty of other people who are not in the library field, who may not be in contact with the library field, who will be interested. Um, what I suggest is we've got seven minutes to go. Our panelists can see the question. So we have one from Alice Ineza um, on, in regards to recommendations, what role can civil societies play in the implementation and alignment with libraries? And one from Yang Baudu, um, which is how do you envision libraries evolving in support of the imperative to respond to crises with agility as opposed to rigidity? So what I will do is, is open the floor, um, in particular to, to Emily, Paolo, Francesco, um, to offer your answers either to these two questions or to the, the one that I've asked. Francesco, can I ask you to go first? Well, I think very briefly, I think seen from the, the point of view of the United Nations, we, we're here, we're in Geneva, we are the, the, the library of the United Nations Geneva Library and Archives here. I think that this, this agility is correlated to the availability of quality information. So the first thing that I would see the UN doing as one of the library systems out there, because there are, there are I don't know, hundreds of thousands. If you look at this impressive, actually I should congratulate you in public, uh, IFLA for doing this library map, which is a library of libraries. I, I, find, I find it wonderful to browse through that. And also the example that they have, the, the link library to uh, SDGs. But one of the things that the UN has done not so well so far is to serve out through the circuits of knowledge systems what is beneath the water, the larger part of, uh, of the UN knowledge, which is an, uh, you know, an immense iceberg of data information knowledge that has been produced in over 70 years of, of practice, basically in all fields of international relations. So when I look at Paolo's organization or, or WHO organization, you, you know, each and every one of these uh, staffers and experts writes you know, tons of pages in, in, uh, in uh, per single portion of their career. And it's very hard even 
for the CEPs to find it. So the first thing that the UN should, should do is to get a grip on the amount of information that resides through the pipes of the system and distribute those through uh, open access as much as possible, open access, you know, save everything that Paolo has taught us uh, during this session, but as much as possible open access through a knowledge network that could be global. So there is this thing that the UN has that I'm not sure we're leveraging the knowledge management field, which is universality principles, but universality in territorial system is a principle because we're everywhere. And so that should be of help to many, many countries, a sub-country level to many, many communities. My dream is to have each and every public library around the globe having a tap for UN validated true information on all, 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 all areas that uh, are involved in, 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 in building Agenda 2030. We have less than 10 years to go for Agenda 2030. I'm already worried with which agenda we'll have after 2030. So it's legitimate to think that around 2025, some member states of the UN will come up and say, hey, why don't we have a General Assembly uh, meeting on what we're going to do in 2031 and that needs to be approved maybe in 28 right so we're there we're not that far it's 2021 going for 22 and so i think that as we test people for covid covid is testing our systems and i think we have a lot to learn and we prefer looking the other way in my opinion thank you and i think that's such a powerful reminder that yes the the future is coming at us very quickly <laughs> and that there is there's this this potential to shape something for afterwards but of course in order to do that we need to act now to make sure that that information is available and um, paolo emily did you have any thoughts and, and paolo for yeah. example even even talking about the work you're already doing to encourage I, governments to i think we can i mean i would probably bore a lot of people saying what we do but uh, just following up uh, one to send two short messages. One is really linked to what Francesco said about, uh, um, and it's uh, answering your question about what the UN can do. I cannot speak of for the UN, I can speak in general about what international organization within the room of freedom we, do, we have, because often our member states decide what we should do. So in terms of process, I don't have a lot to say what uh, you, you, you mentioned indicators. It's a good idea, but it's not really for me to say. Within the, our institutional freedom, there are already things that we can do. And I see major steps forward in this area, which is make uh, our sources freely and easily accessible. And there are, as you know, Stephen, progresses in terms of, for instance, there is a working group set up with all in, with 20 international organizations to change the licensing framework of our content. For instance, WIPE already switched into for CC Creative Commons 4.0, and we are working tirelessly to inform other agencies, and Francesco will be happy to follow up on that. It's, uh, I can tell you, I've been working on this project since I joined WIPO, and now I white hair, it's, it's really is not easy, and but, you can see the difference is now when you enter the WIPO website, you can clearly, you have a message that you can do things, most of things without the need to ask permission. So I think it's the good step we can do there. Secondly, it's an answer to the question about what libraries and civil society can do. Well, you have a big role to play. Uh, WIPO is, uh, is the agenda of WIPO is, is shaped significantly through the influence uh, and suggestion and the technical expertise of civil society and observers and libraries are an essential uh, players and uh, cooperator in a number of initiatives. Just, I don't want to enter in the hot topics, two hot topics, but the one I mentioned today about public sector information not being subject of policies in most of countries of the world this is something that libraries can draw attention on. Why, why most of the government are not, uh, for instance, creating a repositories of research that has been funded by public funds? I, I don't know, like things like that, you, it's, it's really, really um, important that uh, anything we go and do from our technical expertise 
it's supported by a ground request for a real uh, need that comes from you, from the library, from the people of this society that lives in the real lives on a daily basis. So for, for us, for, for me, for an international civil servant, um, it's a great help having an organization like IFLA that identifies the real need so that we can focus better our work. Thank you. Th 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 thank you so much. And thank you for the shout out. And also, I guess, as you say, answering Alice's question that civil society has this vital role in identifying the need and then calling out because otherwise inertia means that things will tend to stay as they are. So, Emily, I wanted to offer you a, an opportunity to add anything. As yeah, I also wanted to react on this question on the relationship between civil society and libraries, because I think this is also um, an opportunity of the Agenda 2030 to connect with other actors and uh, libraries have to do this uh, effort now also to open their minds and to work with uh, different um, organizations. But uh, with the civil society, there is always the issue that Tan was uh, uh, saying before that uh, it's always uh, interpreted as a political uh, view or political action and we are exactly into that now in Switzerland and my reflection about that is to say that libraries have to to communicate about the role of libraries everything but what we said before but also on the professionality of librarians we uh, have a, we have methods to work we also have a code of ethics we have a, we have ways to go to into these questions and to to solve these problems of course it's difficult uh, we are always challenged with this we have to find a balance but we are not uh, we are professionals so i think we also have to 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 say this and to to make it clear towards the the government Thank you so much. Um, and I just wanted to thank thank everyone, to Francesco, Paolo, Raphael, Emily, Tom, for, for your interventions. I know we're running just over, so I'll keep my closing extremely short, but it's been an incredibly rich session. I know I've got lots of notes written down, so when I write up the report from this, I'm, I'm going to have plenty to, to, to put in there. I think it's a that point made at the, at the beginning by so many people of, of the vital importance of information that, it's something that can't be taken for granted, both because still there are so many people who are missing access and because simply having technical, physical access isn't good enough. And that we've seen the demand for this grow, the need to actually take action, to intervene in order to make sure that <clears throat> access to information becomes a reality for all, not just one sector, not just one group of the population that, just as we need to leave no one behind, we need to leave no one uninformed. And then the recommendations we've had at the end about, firstly, involving information professionals, involving libraries in discussions, in thinking about the different dimensions of information in policy making. But then, of course, the responsibility for libraries and civil societies to, to make sure that people are aware of this to make sure that the importance of information as a driver of development at all levels is properly recognized. I think that that, that represents a, a really good recipe for change. And as I think you've all heard, there's so much work already going on on the ground to make this happen. So I hope that in a year's time, we'll be able to look back and see hopefully lots and lots of progress at all levels, that we're moving towards that reality of informed governments and informed societies. And, <clears throat> Looking forward, as Francesco set out, to planning for what comes next, what comes after 2030, on a well-informed basis, but obviously including information at the heart. So with that, I wanted to thank everyone for your participation. Um, we will put up a, a recording and we'll share the link with all those who registered for this meeting. And in short, thank you very much. And I wish you a very successful rest of the regional forum and a very good weekend. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.